welcome to <laughs> welcome to Matters Over Miles. Um, I'm Mary Pat Smithson. This is Whitney Walker. Thank you for saying my name for me because I really don't like that part. All right. Well, d- you know. well, I'm Kim Merrick. <laughs> Most of our guests so far have <laughs> waited in silence for a couple minutes while we set up the introduction, but hey. You know what, though? It wouldn't be Kim without her just being like, hi, hello. She's just been talking for the last 10 minutes about how she never is on this side of an interview process. She's always behind the scenes or producing or editing or marketing or writing the script. And yet, and yet here she is. You are, so We're going to get weird. <laughs> So naturally saying her name to all of you. Uh, Okay, so as you guys know, for season two of the podcast, we are doing more interviews um, with people that we know and love. This person being one of those people. Uh, And (laughs) what I love about what we're doing is we're trying to let you guys step into our world on a regular basis. A lot of times what it looks like is we just get up on stage and lead worship at a church or we're at some venue and then we have a two minute conversation with people and then we're out the door and that's kind of all you see. But what you don't see is us doing life with these people that are running the boards, are, you know, facilitating the ministry, you know, churches and different things that are going on in the area that we're in and they always stay. So it's kind of like we get to come in and bounce, but these are the people that stay And I love it because their perspective of where they are in the world, what they're dealing with culturally, what they're dealing with um, church world Mm -hmm. is is different everywhere. And I love Kim because, uh, I mean, I could say the cliche thing of unique perspective of your life, but I, what I love is that we've known Kim for how many years? I've known Kim for 13 years. This well, thirteen <laughs> years last month. Isn't That's that like almost crazy? half my life. Yeah, I was gonna make some sort of joke about how it was half your life, but yeah, if I was twenty six, it would be half my life. So but no. not quite. Or if you were thirteen when we met, which would be wow, that would have been interesting. Which that, sometimes feels it. accurate, but I think you were closer to seventeen. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they seem less thirteen and seventeen seems less of a gap than. It did previously, that's for sure. But Yes, this is my first (laughs) college roommate when I went out into the big bad world at the ripe age of 17. (laughs) Big bad world. (laughs) Whitney, on the other hand, was probably my fifth college roommate (laughs) because I took a gap year and was a junior when we met. (laughs) Yes, Kim Uh, is a good deal older than me (laughs) for various reasons. What? Time uh, being one of them, time the main being one, the biggest would, one. Uh, but yeah, Kim was my first college roommate, and we liked it so much that we did it again the second year. So we lived together for two years in a tiny box, and it was fun. Yeah, for college. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> we had a light up. It's okay. Robotic penguin <laughs> named Mittens. Named Mittens <gasps> that made his Christmas appearance in our dorm room, and it was sort of Mittens. like people would come to see it. From other dorms, like they, it was like an attraction, it was like a pilgrimage. It was like it the was North like Pole s- of Dorm Thirteen. Yeah, it was like a <laughs> spectacle to behold. People were like, we came to see the penguin on Dorm Thirteen too. And we were like, something Here that it is. I never got to experience that I was bummed out by because I was a little bit later in life to y'all's relationship were the dorm throwdown dances and that you Club Two Nineteen. <laughs> I was so bummed. I never got to be a part of that. (gasps) We used to throw uh, dance parties in our dorm room and shove as many people as we could in there and dress strangely. It was a lot of like just 2008, nine pajamas. Yep. And Kim would (laughs) dorm pajamas sit there with like two computers and like DJ like fade in and out of songs. Like it was legit. Was this at the hotel? No, no, this, this is, is a dorm. The 13. circle dorms. Yeah, oh, it was a circle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The circle. R.I.P. Not there anymore. Oh, yeah. also, by the way, our producer Bat in the corner, Nick Williamson. Nick Williamson is here will again. Will interject ever so slightly. Also, if you haven't noticed, I'm in a rocking chair, <laughs> and uh, I will be rocking. Grandma Walker. <laughs> Yes, I love a good you're rocking. Not yeah, to I know, be confused you're with Grandma's Walker. <laughs> no, we are here at Kim's church. Um, it is called 
Cross and Crown yeah. in Seattle, Washington. Been doing lots of these interviews in Seattle, Washington. Mm-hmm. It's a great place to be. I agree. Um, <laughs> half of the state is on fire right now, <laughs> which makes it less great. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, it's but smoky. you know, each part of the country has its downfalls, and forest fires just happens to be the Pacific Northwest's downfall. Well, yes, and the inactive volcanoes, but we don't need to talk about that. No. Some okay. of them are active. Ah, oh, dang it. You're so... Why'd you do that? Sorry. I have never met someone who has more favorite volcanoes. I mean, it makes sense because there's a lot over here, but most of the time people be like, look at that mountain. Kim's like, no, no, that is a volcano. And let me tell let you me tell whether you or not... all about it and the last time that it erupted and if it were to erupt right now, how many thousands of people would die? Well, and look, I yeah. never went into how many people would die because it's... Fairly isolated. All right. Well, Whit and I decided that at the strike of midnight into 2021, Rainier's just going to go. I, <laughs> that one would probably the, do some damage. It'll be the cherry topper of no, the, the year. No, I Baker don't. is far enough away that it would the the impact would be minimal. Uh, okay. The Rainier Lahars would probably reach like the Puyallup area. Which is on fire right now. Nobody knows, so. nobody knows anything about what she's talking about. But what's important is there are volcanoes. They could erupt. <laughs> look, look up your local Lahar <laughs> zones and don't live there. That's all we're trying to say. What are these zones? So this is going to be such an informative <laughs> podcast episode. I just you're going to get there. a little bit of everything. You're not going to even know that you needed it. And that's Ooh. most of the, my relationship with Kim. I didn't know that I needed that. But that's mine forever now. <laughs> that is everyone's Kim relationship is a wealth, with Kim. <laughs> Kim is a wealth of knowledge that usually is only pertinent for small percentages of time. But she has a lot of that information. So she finds herself <laughs> having relevant knowledge almost all the time. I if you so. gather enough. It yeah, just- it's... A wealth that continues to give to the populations around you. (laughs) I think so. So Anyway. Today. Today, (laughs) the reason that we have Kim on the show is not to talk about volcanoes. Even though we could. um, Or to recount old college dorm room circumstances. Even though we could. Even though we could. (laughs) (laughs) Like the time I used Kim's toothbrush. And then told me about it at a later date. (laughs) And then bought me the wrong toothbrush to replace it. Why would I ever, ever? I'm thinking about that now. I'm like, why would I ever feel just like, you know what? I'm going to use another person's toothbrush today. Like, you must have felt extremely safe. I guess so, "Eh, man. I was just vibing in my own. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you felt that safe because I suddenly felt less safe when I learned about it. (laughs) <laughs> now i mean i don't blame you at all if somebody even i think even if mp at this point if she was like hey i used your toothbrush today i would just be like why but why you're that's exactly how i felt could you have not just gone a day without brushing your teeth <laughs> like that would have been way better anyway we're going to talk about <laughs> something that kim has lots of knowledge and information about and also feels very passionate about i would say mm. Um, and that topic is human trafficking. Jeez, how about which that? Which is left another, yeah, you know, first. left hook into your, <laughs> <laughs> into your, you know, just regular everyday conversation. Um, I, this is another thing that there have been many news stories on lately. There has been much speculation. There has been much assumption. To some people, they have never heard of this topic before. To some people, they think they know everything about this topic. And I think it's just one of those things that we, as a community, and specifically as the church, could do well with, would be just to open our ears and eyes and listen to people that have had lots of experience in this field of knowledge Mm -hmm. and that have some good stuff to say as far as how we can be good stewards of having this information. So, and with that, I think it would be cool if she let everyone in on a little bit, like where she's from, yes. life, how did you got to this How did point? you get to what it is that you're doing and what do you do? <laughs> Great. Uh, well, I was born in New Jersey, but we moved to Washington when I was four. Um, 
<laughs> I've I've mostly grown up in northwestern Washington. Went to school with uh, Whitney at the school that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> and when I was there, actually, was really the first time that I heard about human trafficking. When one of my other dorm mates had taken a trip to uh, Thailand. Then she started, when she came back, she was very impacted and she started sort of forming this new organization, which still exists today and is still doing work in Thailand today called Freedom 424. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I like always re- love remembering that that's yeah. out there. Like I, yeah. I love that organization, but oh, yes. Cool. Go ahead. Uh, so after graduating, I moved back to Seattle and joined a church. And through this church, I heard... Um, about this other organization that was like just barely getting off the ground. Like they hardly existed. I don't think they were even incorporated as a nonprofit yet. Um, and just like for the first time, uh, sex trafficking was really brought home for me. Like, Oh, this is something that happens here. This is something that is not just Thailand. This is not just international, but it's here and in this community. And I are, I always kind of knew that because I used to come to Seattle over the summers and we would drive up and down 99 and we would see the women out on the streets. Yeah. Um, you can still do that to this day. And that's, there's, there's a story there. We may or may not get into that later. All right. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> about why women, like there was a period where there weren't a lot of women on the streets. And I think a lot of people assumed sex trafficking was gone, but now they're back and there's a reason. Um, that being backpage.com was seized by the federal government and shut down. Well. Um, so, <laughs> anyhow, that was, that was a side note. Um, but, uh, so that was back in 2009. I moved to Seattle really, really soon thereafter. Heard of this organization that was just kind of started up. I got in touch with one of the founding founding people. And started doing a little bit of volunteer graphic design work. Like, I designed probably the second or third iteration of their logo. I'm, like, fresh out of design school. She's really good, by the way. I'm okay. Kim designed some of our very first concert posters. We don't need to get into that. Yes, we do! (laughs) Whenever we played, like, around town, like, before we were Water Within, when we were still the band you're about to hear, Kim would design our I never little. want to think about anything that I designed before about 2015. We still have all of those. Do you remember? We found oh them. God. Wasn't there a oh, lion? Oh, yeah, they're in a... Wasn't what? there a lion or yes, something? Yes, there's a lion. The one that with the lion. Cool. Okay, the lion one was cool. That the was green cool. one that you did for me with the peach. The peach. Yep. Yeah. I love that one. Okay, one so the posters were cool. It. The band you're about to hear, like, the neon sign graphic was the worst. <laughs> it was that totally was... perfect for the time nope, that Nope, nope, wasn't in. me. Definitely was not. The stick figures? I didn't. <laughs> I didn't do that. Nope. Yep. <laughs> nope. Aww. Whatever. Anyway. It holds a heavy amount of nostalgia. Not in my going. portfolio. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't think your portfolio needs a, stick a design figure. that you did while you were still in design school. No, no, not at this point. It's been a while. Anyhow, so I started doing <laughs> these, uh, just a little bit of design work for them, and then told. Uh, this woman, her name's Bridget, she's great, um, that whenever Rust was ready to hire me, like, give me a call. Yeah, cool. Um, So Rust is the organization. Uh, It's an acronym for Real Escape from the Sex Trade. Not real estate from the sex trade, which a lot of people... What? That's what... That's a lot of people hear that. Um, Yeah, Real Escape from the Sex Trade. We call it Rust. Um, We're based out of Seattle. Um, and it was about seven years later when I got a Facebook message from Bridget who was like, rest is ready to hire you. (laughs) You want to, and like, of course, in that seven years, I had expanded my, my professional experience, got a lot of experience in social media, marketing, communications. Um, so it was in 2017 that I, joined the team at REST as the media and communication manager and have been doing it ever since. Very cool. I uh, take care of pretty much all public-facing communications like emails, social media, annual reports, big communications like that. It's I get to do a lot of so interviewing and writing writing survivor stories, which is one of my favorite parts so, of my job. Yes. The title definitely 
minimizes the scope oh. of what you actually <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, and it sounds like I might have a team, but I ah <laughs> uh, yes, I work of- I work on a team, but I am the I am the communications and media and marketing department Very all cool. wrapped up into one spicy baked potato. <laughs> Yes. I think what I've always loved about you, Kim, is that with every with every new thing that kind of enters your life, you gain the information, but then you steward it so well. There's a heavy amount of wisdom that you carry in all of the stuff that you know. Like I some people are like, ah oh, yes, here's these random facts. Aren't I the coolest person ever? And I never feel that way. So the, cool. I, I don't. I mean, like, I think I think maybe other people, they might misinterpret that. But, like, from <laughs> but from your heart, like, uh, with our, my friendship with you specifically, apart from you being, you know, the roommate situation, what I've loved is that any time that I had a question on something that I really didn't understand, I was able to come to you and go, can you just teach me about this? And I walk away feeling like not only have I been informed, but I have been supported to thrive in that element of new knowledge. But the fact that you're doing all of that stuff for rest, yeah, it's incredible. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, the context of this season of podcasts, IGTV shows, is we've been asking people how we intersect this topic, whatever topic we're talking about, with the broader context of being in Christian community and working as the capital C church Mm -hmm. um, to steward, like you said, steward this information and truth about this topic well. There's lots of um, information going out and around, many topics of conversation that are not true or not fully the truth and so I think maybe if you could talk a little bit about what the organization that you work with does specifically and like what the goal is for you know like you work as communication manager but like what is the what's the big picture goal of rest and like what what things they work on yeah so rest like everything we do at rest is really really motivated out of the belief that every single person is worthy of love. And that includes just like very vulnerable people who have experienced some really horrific things. Like one of the lines that we use a lot is everyone deserves to be loved. Everyone deserves a life free from exploitation. Mm. Um, And from that, we've kind of pulled out our mission, which is to provide pathways to freedom, safety, and hope for those who have been exploited in the sex trade or sex trafficking. And there's a little bit of nuance, nuance there. Um, but yeah, so there, there are a few different types of anti-trafficking organizations. There are like your awareness organizations Mm -hmm, that are basically just yelling, which like all of these types of organizations are necessary. But like the anti or the awareness organizations are just the people who are just feeding you stories, like telling you, you need to get engaged in this somehow. Like this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. There are the, um, oop, lost a word. (laughs) Uh, Starts with an A. I know that. Not awareness. Um, Anyhow, they're the organizations that (laughs) um, enact, try to enact policy policy change okay um they're the ones who are like making petitions and advocate advocate organizations and that's a little confusing because we do actually have advocates at rest but we're not they're advocates that work with survivors not advocates who are changing policies changing policies got it and then rest is a direct service organization so we actually work face-to-face with survivors um not me personally most of the time But, like, our programs teams are providing direct service to survivor victims and survivors of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, And they're, excuse me, we operate a low barrier shelter. We operate a drop-in center, um, which has, like, within the drop-in center, or we call it our Pathways Services Center, um, we have an integrated health clinic where survivors can come for 
uh, mental health mm -hmm. appointments, so cool. uh, chemical dependency, mm -hmm. um, uh, basic health care needs. Um, and then we also operate a long-term recovery house program, which is actually open to all forms of trafficking survivors. Mm. Um, and so it's sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, most of what we do is centered on sex trafficking. Uh, like our shelter is open to uh, people who identify as women and are of a certain age range and are sex trafficking survivors. Mm. Our house is also open to labor trafficking survivors. Um, we operate a community advocate team, which are the people that really go out like and literally meet survivors where they're at. Wow. Um, and a lot of this is connected to through our 24 hour hotline where a survivor can call or text and say, Hey, I just need emotional support right now. And yeah. get in touch with someone who will listen or call. Like I've heard stories of our advocates or hotline staff, just like reading a bedtime story over the phone No, or just um, like we're, we're not, we are a Christian organization, but we're not a proselytizing organization. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, so what, like we in, invite faith engagement, but we don't, require it mm. and we don't require it to look like what we believe mm. um and there there have been stories of like our advocates as they're invited just being able to read bible verses wow. um to survivors who are struggling or um like going to a coffee shop and meeting someone there in their neighborhood rather yeah. than requiring them to come to us for services um like when there's not a pandemic going on, we have like group dinners, but people can still come and pick up food. Yeah, cool. We have a resource closet where they can grab clothes or hygiene products. Dude, yeah. rest is like ginormous. Um, awesome. This is so cool. <laughs> yeah, and we do it with all about 30 people. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's incredible. Very yeah, cool. it is really incredible. Um, and I'm very, very, very proud to be a part of it. And it really, like, one, one cool thing about Seattle is that a lot of the, um, advocacy, direct service and advocacy, uh, organizations really work hand in hand. Like we're partners with some of the other organizations that are doing the same work in That's town. Great. We refer to one another. Yes. Like if, yeah. if we don't have space open in our community advocacy program, we might refer to another local yeah. service. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one thing that I find really encouraging is just to see the collaborative, um, Yep. nature of anti-trafficking organizations yeah. in this community and in this state. Yeah. Um, Whatever. But yeah, so that's that's what REST does. What was the rest of the question? Yeah. <laughs> I think that hints about, sums up whatever was the rest of my question, I'm sure. Just to give people kind of a general overview of like what working in this kind of... I don't think I knew all of that. I know I didn't yeah. do it. I'm know shocked that, that I did. Like <laughs> Me too. It's hard to remember it all at once. You did a great yeah. job. I wrote the website, so I should <laughs> I should know these things, but Yeah. So maybe um can you talk a little bit about how working at REST and really like REST is important and we obviously want to like honor the work that you do, but in general with this kind of like content and this narrative that is a part of so many people's lives around the world, but in America as well, working like day in and day out with these kinds of stories, how has it changed how you see people in general? And then like how you wow. kind of like hold the gospel Oof. in your perspective. That's a big question right? for starters. Let <laughs> uh, <laughs> me just mumble into the mic for a minute here. <laughs> um, so one thing that I'm particularly passionate about in the context of my role, like telling stories of survivor yeah. is just s sort of the notion as it's kind of known in nonprofit communities is just ethical storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, and what does it mean to, honor the story and honor the survivor yes. as we're telling these stories, like at like specifically at rest, we take a lot of care in making sure that whoever is telling their story is 
emotionally ready to tell their story. We don't yeah, just find the on. most outstanding story and say, like, let's manipulate this person into telling their story. We don't yep. we don't do that. And then like throughout that process, like whenever I do an interview, usually their advocate is present for um, you know, just That's awesome. safety, comfort. And also that person can help with the interview a lot yeah. of the time. Um and then like as we get ready to publish their stories we always invite like part of the interview process is just letting you know like okay you've given us permission to amplify your story um and i like looking at it that way like i'm like they're telling their story i'm just making it loud yeah Oof. Um, yes. and uh so like really trying to honor honor that story without bringing that sensationalist yeah sort of like yes um, like we actually, I work pretty hard to tell these stories fairly neutrally mm-hmm. without a lot of emotional language in it, just because people will have their own emotions when they read this yeah, stuff. The truth, yeah. yeah. Um, and so just try to like really stick to the facts, really honor the story as the survivor told it, but then also invite them into the process of choosing, do you want to use a pseudonym and a stock photo or do you want to use your real name and a photo of yourself? Cool. Is this safe for you to use a photo yeah. of yourself? Yes. Is it emotionally safe? Like, and we we talk about all the stuff like, we're going to put this story out and you've signed this release for this. But if someday you want to, us to reel this story back in, you can come to us and we'll do everything we can. Like, obviously we can't unprint things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and we can't un-email people. Um, but we will do everything in our power to take the story back in also with the caveat that once something's online, it's online forever. Um, but also a lot of uh, survivors of sex trafficking really have a much better grip on that than most people because they've had right. sex ads out there yeah, okay. that are maybe like impacting their ability to get a job if their yeah. employer is Googling or something yeah. like that. Um, so they they typically really understand that point that the internet is forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. But yeah, we just try to really, really honor people as we go through every step of the storytelling process. And for me, that like as that correlates to the gospel is just rooting every single thing that we communicate in the image of God. Yeah. Um, like, like really, and that like that's where that everyone deserves to be loved belief comes from is Imago Dei. Um, and just like, like in every step of the journey, trying to figure out how we can really, uh, just root our message in like this, not just like everyone is worthy of love, but that this specific person is worthy of love. Mm -hmm. Um, and how can we tell the story of rest that everyone is worthy of love. Uh, how can we tell this specific story? Um, yeah. Does that? Oh yeah. Okay. Great. That's great. Great. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm okay. sure I could have rambled more, but no, that's so good. I, it's, it's fun for me every time you say Imago Day because I know how much you mean that. Um, That's for my people, favorite. Yeah. Okay. For people that don't understand what that means, can you explain that to them? Yeah. It's just it's just the idea that every single human being was created in the image of God, and therefore has immeasurable worth and value, um, and just like innate worthiness hmm. within them, um, mm-hmm. loved by God, no matter where they've been, who they are, what they've done, what's been done to them. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Somebody That's a Mago day. Yep. Somebody mm-hmm. need to hear that. Whoa. See the cool thing too about Kim is that she lets you be who you are. And we have many of time her and I <laughs> <laughs> talked about how I'm like, I'm rainbow and sunshine person. And to which you replied to me because I was kind of like, ah, that's just who I am. I, I, a oh well cut type of thing. But then you came out of nowhere and said something along the lines of like, yeah, but clouds and rain people need those yeah. people and can't get that kind of stuff without. Yeah, we can't only have one kind of weather person. <laughs> and I'm a big storm cloud. <laughs> 
<laughs> Not uh, the kind that produces lightning, though. Well, that's good. Just lots of wind and rain. What kind of weather pattern am I? Oh, gosh. Hmm. Yeah. Go there. I'm waiting for this. Then. I'm just like going through different cloud types and making sure I have them correctly <laughs> assigned in my head. Um, maybe you are a firestorm. <laughs> yes. Shoot. Yes. I was going to say ice storm. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. there it is. Um, <laughs> Not to be confused with one of the plagues. Oh. <laughs> No, I would have to. I would need to actually do some research on weather patterns to figure that out. Okay, I kind of like the firestorm. Firestorm could work. I, I, I mean, that was yeah, that was more of a joke thing. on my part. Those are the um, new enneagrams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a new enneagram <laughs> test thing. Uh, cool. You're a weather pattern. This is a very creaky rocking chair. I'm not sure if you can hear that in my microphone. I but. mean, I can hear it in my ears. Because. Ah, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Whew. All right. Well, um, I think I asked you earlier today, like if you had something that you wanted to, one thing that you like really wanted to communicate to people who don't have a lot of previous engagement in this topic, yeah. what is it that is important for us who have not been interacting with this kind of story narrative work of people who are coming out of sex trafficking or involved in sex trafficking, like having this, you know, like you're obviously rather skilled at talking about it. And yes, it's because you've spent hours upon hours upon hours engaging with this kind of content for people who have not engaged with it. What is the thing that you feel like is important? I think I could probably summarize that in a few bullet points. (laughs) I don't know if it's a one Excellent. thing. Um, I think it's it's really important to acknowledge that this is here. Wherever you are, it's here. Um, it knows no geographic bounds. Um, this is this is not a across the seas. This is not um, in big cities. Although we are in a big city right now, and it is here. Um, but it, w- wherever you are, this is probably happening. Yeah. Mm. No community is immune. And it happens at every socioeconomic level. It happens across every gender. It happens across every race. There are certain factors that like will make someone more vulnerable sure. or st- statistically more likely. Yep. But it is everywhere. Yeah everywhere um so like we see a lot of sensationalized information about like who gets kidnapped but that's that's really not the narrative um it's not that that doesn't happen but that's not that's not the common by and large how it happens yeah yeah (laughs) um the other the other thing that we like we know real well at rest and um just one of the things that sort of our service model is a little bit based around is that we know it can take like one toxic relationship to draw someone into the sex trade and it can take one positive, healthy, loving relationship to draw them out or really begin that journey out. We also, we all like, this is not a rescue mission. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't just like go in and, like it's not the headline Extract story. Somebody. We don't like go in. I mean, these these stories do happen. Like we've recently seen some headlines on this. Like we don't just go in and like find a bunch of kids in a warehouse somewhere. Um, it like it takes one bad relationship mm, where someone's yeah. probably looking to be loved, but not getting that need mm-hmm. melt met to get them drawn into that. And it can take just that one positive relationship. Yeah. Someone saying like, what do you want? Yeah. Like, wow. Um, and we, like we know based on 10 years of rest existing now, which actually officially makes us a very old direct service organization. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. Um, yeah. We just celebrated 10 years last November, uh, which I guess means we're coming up on 11. 11. Yeah. <laughs> Happy um, birthday. Whoa. <laughs> That was a fast year. Also simultaneously very <laughs> <Nah>. slow. <laughs> very, very. 
Um, I can't tell if time is passing or it's not. Um, yeah. Says the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mm, one <laughs> train of thought skipped a track. Yeah, <laughs> people. One bad relationship. One good relationship. One good relationship. Um, yeah, we know. Like, it's not that the. It's not like this one and done thing. It's not like we go in and find someone, or they come to us once and they're like, ah. Oh. Yeah. Um, like the number that we use is on average, it takes someone five point eight times to attempt exiting before they yeah. finally fully exit the sex trade. Mm. Um and there are a lot of different factors that go into that, like a lot of barriers centered around like uh trauma bonding yeah. and mm-hmm. wow. uh mental health mm-hmm. trauma, um a lot like homelessness, joblessness, yeah. chemical dependency. Like there are so many barriers that you have to overcome to get out of the life. And rest is really seeking just to come alongside yeah. and help you overcome those barriers. I sure. Love I love it. I love it. So I think I want to just capitalize on what you said a little bit in that I'm sure a lot of people out there are like, I don't have a organization that I know in my community that is doing this kind of work. So mm-hmm. What is it that I can practically actually be doing to, you know, to help with this kind of thing that is happening in the world? Um, and based on just like some of the statistics that you are sharing, I think that just being a good parent that loves your children, being a good friend to the people around you, being kind to people that you engage with on a daily basis mm-hmm. and infusing that continuation of the Imago Dei image into people that you come across on a regular basis could be part of somebody's story that you don't know what they're living with. You don't know what they've been through or if they've recently come out of being trafficked or if they are in the midst of being trafficked and, you know, you see them on the side of the street somewhere like Mm. crossing a crosswalk. I mean, you're not really positive any information about the people that are in front of you, except for that they were made in the image of God and they are innately worthy of your love and kindness and respect. Come on. And so your engagement with that person could be one of those 5.8 interactions yeah. that they have with someone outside of their context that could be really meaningful. Additionally, you know, I think that what you said, if it just takes one one toxic relationship to send somebody spiraling down into a bad situation Mm -hmm. and it takes one positive relationship to send them on a different trajectory. I think that everybody has that in their story somewhere to some degree, Um, even if it's not directly pertaining to this kind of narrative or this content. um, You know, that's part of why God made us to be in community with other people because right at that pivot point of brokenness or despair or need or fracture, it's kind of like this vulnerable state of a human being did something that really hurt me, that has really broken me down mentally, that yeah. has physically abused me, that has lessened my worth. And so then therefore it takes the work of a human being, obviously through the Holy Spirit's power, but to re- reassess and redefine who you are and to give you kind of the courage and the wherewithal to move in a different direction where you actually can believe that you are worth something again. Um, so I think that that is, you know, something to be thoughtful about, at least in as far as just like <laughs> how you treat people that you don't agree with or how you treat people that... Mm. You know, you have no real idea like what kind of things they have walked through in their life. Um, But your interaction with them could be something that really is very cataclysmic for their future. So with all of that, my like what you were starting to say with Mm -hmm. the question, I think that a lot of times Christians want to get behind something like this so that they can feel like they're a part of it. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know if this is kind of like, well, if I shove money in, in somebody's face for something, then it'll progress to something else. And I can feel like I've been a part of that and all those different things. But I guess 
what I'm asking is what's the not so obvious answer that people might not totally love? Because you can always post something on social media. You can always, you know, burp, 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 you know, like announce things from your personal balcony, like we need to do something, but maybe like the harder side of this, or maybe the thing that somebody might not want to hear, mm-hmm. like what, because, because I feel like there's more to this. I think you leaning on that dang Amago day is the thing, right? Like, I feel like that's kind of somehow the key, but in your own experience yeah. or even within people that have, you know, been a part of this work for so long. Well, uh, I'll start by saying one thing that most people probably don't want to hear. Like we don't send out anyone who's not trained Mm -hmm. onto the streets. Come on. Um, so we actually Mm -hmm. like our, our volunteers who work directly with clients go through a series, a training series, like everyone. And I don't know when this podcast is going to be released right now because there's a pandemic. We are doing these trainings online, so they are available Mm-hmm. outside okay. of seattle it's called rest training day we do it quarterly um so cool and that's that's like the first step if you're going to go on to be on our outreach team or work in our drop-in center there are more trainings that you need to yeah go to um all rooted around really like understanding commercial sexual exploitation understanding yep. the dynamics of the yes. sex trade and then also being able to provide trauma-informed care Praise God. <laughs> Say that again. Um, yes. So like, I'm not going to be the person that sits here and says, well, if you see someone on the streets, just go talk to them. No, <laughs> go and please them don't. Over for dinner. You're, you might be actually putting them in harm's way. Yeah. Like, um, please, please don't do that. <laughs> um, but I think honestly, the thing that people probably aren't going to want to hear as much is that like, whatever the organization is in your community, um, or, you know, shameless plug for rest. Like we, we primarily serve in King County, but we actually have a pretty national influence because mm. we are an old, yeah. Yeah. Um, direct service organization. We, um, not just are informed by other organizations that have similar programs, but we're also doing the informing. We, uh, help younger nonprofits, mm. um, like rest would be a great organization to financially support but if not rest like find the closest place in your community that is providing trauma-informed care yep um like re like (laughs) trauma informed care care. (laughs) like and not to discount the work of advocacy organizations because they're really important or um awareness organizations but like man your direct service organizations in your community are probably uh, they they probably need funding for something. Yeah. Um, whether they're working like on getting a house up and running, taxing whether they're work emotionally, yeah, and physically too. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we are very very aware of like the effects and impacts of secondary mm-hmm. trauma. Come yep. on. Um, yes, and yes. like employee self care is a pretty mm-hmm. high priority. Uh, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say like, don't. Don't go out there if you're not trained. Get trained. There. Yeah. Get trained. There you go. So that's going to take some like effort <laughs> and some time Maybe and even some your money. engagement and some yeah. content that is pretty gnarly. Some yeah. sort of cost on your behalf. Yes. Not, yeah. not the general necessarily theme financially. Of these, of these shows has been, it's going to cost you something. Come yes. on. Yes. Not, not something. Not something, but. But like. Something. Something. <laughs> yeah. But I think also like it's it's also extraordinarily rewarding work. Like when sure. yeah. when we get to like it's um like when we get to watch shame start to melt away. Come yeah. on. Um and see people like being just find those pathways to freedom, yeah. safety, and hope. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's pretty it's incredible. Amazing. And honestly, like a lot of my job is getting to tell the story from the point where um, people are um, starting to find those pathways. Yeah. Like I'm not usually telling their story when they're very far down the pathway. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and that's like, that's one thing we take care of with that rest too, is just like, just the idea that there, there are no pink bows. Like nobody's story is tied up into this pretty little package. Like, come on. Yeah. Um, this mm. is lifelong work. Glory to glory to glory to glory. Um, yes. And, mm. uh, just like we, we might be telling someone's story from the point where they're, uh, still in our shelter. We might be telling the story from the point where they just found their first square job. Mm. We might be telling the story from the point where they just got their first apartment after yeah. being homeless for years. Um, but there's still more so journey good. after that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's very cool. Um, something I, I kind of feel compelled to sort of like take a little bit of a right turn on. Um, we went camping before, uh, yes, we, we spent did. any time in the great city of Seattle with Kim for a couple of days out in the literal middle lovely. of the woods. She made every meal for us. Yes. On a I, campfire. She's so good at it. It was really awesome. <laughs> um, you mentioned something about the average age at which hmm. people wow. are introduced into um, being sold in some kind of way um, or exploited. Um, and then you talked about some sort of percentage, and I'm not sure that you had the direct percentage, but I wonder if by chance you had come across that information since we talked about it, about um, kids in the foster care system and how... Yeah, they I kind don't, of funnel through. And don't this, quite have that. And this is when, with whatever you say, basically what you told us earlier, this is probably the poke the bear moment. Yeah, nobody wants to talk about <laughs> because this. Because what we don't want to realize is that what you're about to say to people can be a way that people prevent it, but it's a big cost. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the average age for entry into sex traffic is into sex trafficking is between 11 and 14 years old. Mm. Um, and again, every gender, every socioeconomic background, but there is a particular lean towards children, minors, young girls, never underage women. Mm. Um, just get that language out of your vocabulary Come please. On. <laughs> underage women, yeah. No. That's not No. A I think real you mean girls, girls or boys. Underage yes. women mm. equals girl. Oh. <laughs> um they're, <laughs> they're Which is so interesting cuz you're called a girl far past when you become a woman when it benefits the other party. <laughs> right, for oh, sure. You a for girl. sure. <laughs> oh. But then <laughs> poke, poke. suddenly when it benefits them to call you a woman. <laughs> yeah, so I don't Anyways, yeah. go ahead. Of course. Um, <laughs> so the average, podcast. average age of entry is between 11 and 14 years old. Mm. Um, but we also know it is particularly impactful for people who have experienced the foster care system, mm. which is also often Oof. correlated very closely with poverty, which is also correlated very closely with race. Uh, um, so yeah. there, there's like... Lots of overlaps. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. There's uh, lots of intersections, lots, lots of overlaps, lots of things that like sort of set someone on a trajectory to become more likely to be yep. exploited in that way. Yes. Um, I don't have the specific data around foster care, but like there are reports out there that refer to it as the foster care to trafficking pipeline. Hmm. Um, uh, I, someone is drastically more likely to wind up in the sex trade if they have had contacts with the foster care system. And the more contact they have with the foster care system, the Jesus. more, oh, go, gosh, uh, fact check me on this. I think the average number of placements for a minor who has been trafficked in the foster care system, not being trafficked in the foster care system, but they've been trafficked and had contact with the soft yeah. foster care system. I think the average number of placements is something like 27.4. So they're being, they're being moved about ping ponged all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and like, I think it's one of the really important things to remember when we're talking about this, this like 11 to 14 average age of entry is that these are the, these are the people that grow up to be the people that people say are doing this because they want to. Come. Um, ah. so like, ah. um, and there are, there are like yeah studies that we can get to on that. Like something like, uh. 
90% of women who are in the sex trade say that if they thought they could leave, they would. <sighs> um, and then we can talk about the shame and the trauma bonding, the, the yeah. barriers that keep them in survival sex. Like if you don't have food yeah. and you can choose, <laughs> if you don't have a place to stay yeah, and this is all you've ever known because it's been happening to you since you were 11. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are just a lot of factors that keep people in, and a mm. lot of those factors start very, very early. Um, an enormous percentage of people who are in the sex trade experienced sexual abuse when they were children. Yes. Uh, upwards of 85% of them are under the control of a trafficker. Yep. Um, so there's, man, there's a lot to go in there, but, like, just just know, like, and I keep, like, I keep that in mind as, I'm driving up Aurora here in Seattle because I, I live in that neighborhood. Yeah. Just that the women that I see out there, it didn't start there for them. Mm-hmm. One. Um, probably started when they were much, much younger. And mm-hmm. some of them are pretty young to begin with. Right. Um, yeah. And it really like, I think one really consistent thing that I've experienced as, as I've interviewed many survivors at this point is just the, as they sort of communicate their first experience with trafficking, like the first time that manipulation was made, whether it was like their like boyfriend asked them to have sex with a friend in exchange for money Mm. or their parent or whoever it was that Mm -hmm. trafficked them from the first time. Um, Just the, shame that immediately gets baked into who they are yeah Yeah. um every other barrier Mm. like the shame alone is enough yeah yes to make someone feel trapped in that world yep and to (laughs) go off of that i in you saying stuff i just kind of felt holy spirit prompting there's so many people that have been sexually abused that have not entered into that kind of a lifestyle but it doesn't count any less that that happened to you for sure it's not okay it shouldn't have happened and the shame that you're basically feeling on yourself or telling yourself well i'm not as bad off as that person might be or these people that have been trafficked no wasn't okay to begin with and you need to know Mm -hmm. that god doesn't think it's okay and that he's the one that sets up verses that say, yeah, if you ch- touch my kids, like you might as well just throw yourself into the middle of a sea with a big stone on your neck because that would be easier to deal with than what I feel against what you've just done to my kids. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. <laughs> generally. so The I, MPV. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I kind of like that. Very bad version. <laughs> No, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I got really excited about that. <laughs> oh, um, that's fine. It's fine. Uh, I To lean into the last kind of part with that, because we talked with one of our other friends here, Zwadi, who um, was adopted from the Congo, and it was a situation where his birth mom died giving birth to him, and that his tribe, their particular tribe, they buried the child with the mom, because it's like, oh, it's your fault. So that's what we're going to do. And his parents are these Irish German people in the middle of Africa. And one of the villagers who rescued Zawadi basically told them, hey, I have a feeling with the way that you talk about your religion and who Jesus is, this doesn't match with what you're saying. Can you take him? Thus his story goes on. But what we were able to talk about with just being... um being pro-life and and recognizing that there's so much more to that statement, the life section of that statement, than just whether or not a child can be born, which I'm not going into any of that. But I feel like with mm-hmm. foster care and there's all those kids out there that are be, having to be taken care of by somebody else besides their parents, and then that being – there's always the possibility of that being a gateway into what you're talking about. And I think even before we get, like, I wholeheartedly, like, I've got a handful of adopted siblings myself. Right. Um, Love you guys. (laughs) Um, I also (laughs) love my bio siblings. I love you all. (laughs) They are nodding and saying, uh I know. Some of them are like, "Mm." (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
But so like, yes, foster care. I genuinely believe that more people should be stepping up to provide yeah. loving, safe home environments with foster care. But b- before we even get there, we need to talk about why are so many kids getting taken and what are the factors that are mm. big, like, like most of like the child welfare system is kids in poverty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, so let's, let's talk about the way the world is set up against kids in poverty. And we can also talk about the racial breakdown of right. this. Um, but like, what need, like, what do we need to equip families with mm-hmm. who are experiencing poverty? How do we set them up to never lose their kids to begin with? Yeah. Like, how do we start from not separating children from parents? Yeah. And I'm not saying, like, there are some situations where, like, if that parent is the child, get them out of there. Right, <laughs> like, yeah, right, totally. Um, but also get them out to there, get them out of there to a place that is safer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Not just a different, <laughs> not just a different dysfunctional place. Um, yeah. Or like, like. Even if you do have to take a kid out, how how do you make that kid feel safe and secure so they're not running away? Yeah, Um, because they're like they're already they've got all this trauma. They they're probably dealing with trauma informed care. um, Get some. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's there's just a lot of stuff that I think trauma informed care. Like yes, step up and be foster parents. If you can't step up and be a foster parents, support organizations who are doing. Trauma informed foster care work. <laughs> yeah. So um, said that there is one kid to be adopted for every one for every church in America. That means like if every church would adopt <laughs> one kid, we would eradicate orphanages Ooh, and the fo- yeah. like the foster care system in America. Like it's a lot. It's a ew, it's not like, that hard. God, it, like it's a lot to take in that being the truth, but it's not a lot yeah. to do emotionally, spiritually. Is it going to be hard and messy? Is that kid probably going to bite you and not trust you? And there's probably going to be some things you have to work yes. through. Yeah. I but just, I, they're not being trafficked. I bit people when I was little. I just like need yeah. you to know that. What's wrong with you? I did. One you of the kids that do. I babysat when I was a teenager uh, bit me so hard. Like he left his dental records as a bruise wow. in my arm. Ooh, um, good story. I still went back and babysat. <laughs> mm. They paid well. Um, well, I love that that. Uh, and I know that not, uh, and I know that <laughs> so many people, it's like not everyone can do that, but you can find, yeah. okay, but, but have you so, asked, have you asked God, ooh. Hey God, is this something that you would like me to do? Well, one thing, because like, if you haven't, <laughs> you can't say, Oh, I'd never do that. That's oh. not something I'm supposed to do. Oh have you asked? Oh. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, one thing like this this church does every every Christmas season we do a diaper bag drive for the foster care system mm. where we like get all of these goods together in a diaper bag and the idea is actually um to give them to the biological family wow. so that they have like the idea like gosh reunification man um, like let's foster families are needed. Adopted, fa- adoptive families are needed, yeah. but let's not just assume that every kid that hits the child welfare system yes. needs to be adopted. Let's try and get them back yeah. here. Let's give this parents the resources. Equip people with what they need. Um, and that's like, that's what the diaper yeah. bag is for is so that when parent comes for their visitation with their child, when they're in foster care, they have the literal physical items they need to care for that baby. Yeah. The last thing that I I just thought of, um, and I feel like this might be a good place to wrap it up, but can you speak a little bit into how we need, uh, what would be your suggestion on people that come out of this kind of situation, that come out of trafficking, and like the, the side of their life that looks like them walking out 
the surviving and being on the other end. Cause we love, we love the underdog story, right? We mm -hmm. love to see the people cross the finish line and then they're done. But after that finish line, there's a whole life to be lived. And I feel like, well, it's just, there is no finish line. That, that's, but that's <laughs> what I mean. Like, but, yeah. but when it comes to Christianity being stoked about like, uh, Christians in general being excited, like, oh, we raised this, we, we met our goal. Let's raise this much money, you know, for, for this organization in this amount of time. And then we do, and then it's kind of done. And then the, all those people are still affected. But like, I guess my thing is, what is it that we do or we can do as people who love Jesus that like, why, stick around for these people after they have gotten out of that system uh hire people with criminal histories um mm -hmm. provide housing to people with criminal histories um Come make on. it make make these things that make it easier to stabilize like literally like like two of the biggest like you can't keep your home if you don't have a job a lot of survivors ha struggle to get jobs or maintain jobs yeah. because they have like these traumatic histories that might give them some like anxiety issues and stuff. A lot of them have criminal histories, so they won't get hired to begin mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Some of them might be missing their basic identification because their trafficker stole it yeah. as a method of control. Yeah. Ah. Um, like make ways for survivors to survive outside of the sex trade. Yeah. Um, like, if you have the opportunity to hire someone, like, if you are an employer, find your local organization and say, hey, do you have someone that needs a job? Yeah. If you own a building, if you are a landlord, find a local organization and say, hey, do you know someone who needs a place to live, maybe yeah. at a discounted rate or in a context where we can work a situation out so that they're... It's not like a 12-month lease that seems impossible. Yeah, or yeah. Or yeah. like maybe, like maybe like mm. not requiring a deposit. Or is there an organization, like one thing that REST does is like we have funding to pay for deposits in first months and stuff like that. Mm. And we're, we're working with a couple of different models of how to provide rental assistance. Like, is there an organization so cool. as a landlord that you can work with yeah. to like reserve a spot or two for people who are looking to stabilize their housing situation? Yep. So that's so practical. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah. And last, like, I think this is the last sure. thing that I want to ask before we wrap it up. How, what, what would you say to, um, I feel like there is a stigma on people who have come out of trafficking. Yeah, they're very well aware of that, by For the way. For sure, yeah. What would you say as far as like some soul work that we can, that I can do, I, me, myself, yeah. Whitney Walker, um, that I can do to like help myself not have a me and them Ooh. mentality Ooh. as far as yeah this was a bad last question for me this is gonna there we've got another hour got, of podcast no, guys no 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 um <laughs> so one thing like and like this is this is me in my own time but also it impacts my work at rest and everything that i do in life one thing that i've really been focusing on for the last three two three years like i have just dived pretty deep into learning about racism, both overt and systemic. I've dived pretty deep into learning specifically about the Nazis, not just like the Holocaust or World War II, but like, how did the Nazis exist? How did yeah. they come in? Like, what, how did that happen? Yeah. And then also apartheid. Mm. Um, like, and I like more than ever, I'm convinced that like, if you want to avoid humanitarian crises, don't look at the humanitarian crises of the past. Look at the 20, 30 years before them hmm. um, because they came out of somewhere. And one thing that's really, really consistent when you when you look at, like, early Nazi writings or the way they formed apartheid um, is just dehumanization. Mm. Oof. Um, yeah. And part of this, like... 
mirror neurons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so like mirror neurons are the so thing. Mirror neurons. <laughs> Do you want to explain mirror neurons? Go ahead. You know what? You are. Um, you're the smart one today. So please. I'm. I'm really not the smart one in this regard. I just like no, have this very base knowledge about a lot of things, and it makes people think I'm smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But so mirror neurons are what really enable us to experience empathy. Like if you don't have mirror neurons, you're in trouble. And so are the people around you. Um, This is, uh, (laughs) it's a problem. Um, But like when you, when you experience, like when you go to the movies and something scary happens and you jump, that's, that's like your brain saying, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. Um, So like it's your, your brain's way of, like your brain doesn't do a good job of separating me from you. And that's that's essentially what empathy is. It's mm-hmm. feeling what the other person is feeling. Mm. Um in or so and we have that very, very naturally, yes. specifically for humans. Not to say that we don't have empathy for animals and other creatures, but we have it very specifically and very strongly for other humans. Mm-hmm. Um so and part of this, part of part of I'm regurgitating another podcast a little bit right now. This is how I learned about it. Um, In order to do like the most atrocious things to people like Mm -hmm. the Holocaust and apartheid, um, you've actually got to turn off the mirror neuron response. You've got to turn off the empathetic response. Mm -hmm. And you do that by looking at people as less than human. Mm -hmm. Um, So So you can't fix or be a part of a solution to a problem that is essentially dehumanizing people by trafficking them by then when they come out of trafficking you're still saying yeah you're less that person uh, is them um, and i am me so for me like the kind of as i started to like read through some like early nazi stuff watch a lot of documentaries listen to a ton of podcasts um i started to just sort of see the pattern of dehumanizing language um yeah and how it starts very subtle and mm-hmm. creeps in and yep. grows. And a lot of eugenic ideas are really baked in around this where we sort of evaluate another person's intelligence and deem like, I mean, you could just scroll through Facebook and see dehumanizing language about like yeah. and e- eugenic ideas about like, oh, the people on the other side of the political fence are just dumb. That's what it is. They're just dumb. They're yeah, lesser yeah. intelligent. It, that's that's eugenics. Um, you are dehumanizing. Um, so for me, like what I've really Mm -hmm. tried to get in the practice of is self-checking when I am finding myself thinking of someone as less than me. Yeah. Come on. Like I stop and do a check and say, okay, what am I believing at that person as that about that person? Where did that idea come from? Mm. Why is it true? How do I stop it? Come on. Um, so like as you're going out and you see someone who you think might be in a trafficking scenario, first off, you don't know. (laughs) Um, Like, yep. Like just because someone is in a short skirt walking down the street doesn't mean, yep. You know, their life story. Come on. Um, But really like stop and think, what am I thinking about that person? Mm -hmm. Am I thinking they're somehow less than me? Does that align with what God says about them? Wow. Like, am I upholding the Imago Dei when I look at that person? Am I honoring that person, respecting that person, seeing that person as a human worthy of, like, dignity, value, value and worth, which mm-hmm. is redundant. Um, <laughs> uh, Necessary. But just, like, man, just stop and evaluate the language that's going on in your head and your yes. heart and stopping to see where... You're de- and this is like beyond trafficking, just sure. like in general. Everything. When you when you everything. see someone with that political bumper sticker, what are you thinking about them? Does it align with the idea of Imago Day? Come on. Like, how do you deal how with about, that? How about, <laughs> we'll land the plane right after this sentence here. <laughs> when you're thinking about people who traffic other people, 
So here's <laughs> okay, yeah. There's no, another no. layer of this whole thing. Let's that's talk like, about this because they rarely come from non-traumatic backgrounds right, themselves. For sure. Whitney just woke up a second bear. <laughs> <laughs> there's many guys he was in the corner in, hibernating. Yeah, and yeah. Just um, off. In that's their narrative too. Wow. So. That's something we talk about a lot. Is just that like trafficker like when we say everyone is worthy of love we believe it and when we say everyone deserves a life free from exploitation we mean the exploiters too and the buyers which is a whole nother podcast yeah 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 yeah, yeah, all of these people are probably dealing with trauma and shame it's all just brokenness or it's none and they are all created in the image of god holy cow all worthy of love and worthy of a life free from exploitation. I just feel like my shoulders, like I, I'm so heavy. Which and falls great... back onto pro life. <laughs> We've already discussed this in 700 other podcasts. I life there, in all of its I, many facets man. is worthy of being loved. What I love, though, Very cool. And if if somebody like Mary Magdalene can roll in Jesus's crew, mm. and he and he is. He is valuing and honoring and supporting and honoring her with the first visitation of his resurrected self. Maybe I should too. Mm-hmm. What? Okay, cool. Right. Well, Jesus is God and I love Jesus. So let's do this. Awesome. <laughs> Kim, you're amazing. I, I learned so much. Now now I'm going to walk outside and be like, Imago Day, Imago Day, Imago Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Imago day, imago day, imago day, imago day. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh boy. I'm so excited. <laughs> I should probably leave that up to the singers here. Well, I thought it was pretty good, though. Your ah uh, before was actually really good, too. I just didn't want to interrupt your flow of consciousness. Um, you guys, awesome. this is so good. And once again, if you're leaving this going, I have more questions, then we have steered you in the right direction. But yes. Kim, we cannot thank you enough. Kim at Iwantrest.com. Yeah. yeah. Ask me questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. There she's up for it and she's a safe place to do that with. Like, man, I and don't know. She's chatty. Oh, that's true. So she'll send she's you got lots of stuff. Don't quote the people that I've known for 13 years on being me being chatty. <laughs> Um, she, she's also one of the reasons I stay on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> let's, not, not let's not do let's that. Let's not plug my Twitter no, here. Let's not do that. We're not going to do that. So rest and yes. <laughs> Kim's is email. It, what is the rest website? I want rest.com. I want rest.com. Rest.com. Very cool. Yeah. You guys, yeah. thank right. you so much for joining us on this thank episode. Thank you for listening to all of this. It's difficult. <sighs> stuff to talk about I need to go like run a lap because I'm like so I'm full it's also very salad well that's true you have been listening to Matters Over Miles with Mary Pat Whitney and Kim so oh yeah and Nick too sorry and Nick Nick. bye everyone (laughs) you guys have a great day and we'll see you next time bye (laughs) thanks so much for joining us on the Matters Over Miles podcast a resource of Water Within Ministries If you would like to be a supporter of the show, head over to water-within.com backslash WWM and click the donate button at the bottom of the page. All donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Thanks again and we'll see you next time.